Well, hello, everybody. Good morning. Good afternoon. We've got folks joining us across the continent today. My name is Jesse. I'm here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. And for those joining us for the first time as the digital education partner of the Toronto Zoo, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, it's been a while since we've had the chance to hang out with the amazing friends at the zoo. Uh, every one of our programs goes live to our YouTube channel at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, their YouTube channel, and their Facebook page. So a big welcome into all our audience from all these amazing places today as we get to explore a little bit about who's new at the zoo. I want to do a big plug before the Easter weekend. This is our last program before Easter, so happy Easter, everybody. I really encourage you all to head to torontozoo.com. You can find out all sorts of amazing stuff about their conservation initiatives, their incredible education work, and what you can see when you go there. I used to be in Toronto. I'm in Newfoundland now. Uh, Toronto Zoo is my home away from home as a kid, and it's always so, so special to get to hang out with the amazing animals there and with my favorite educator in the whole world, Mary Ellen. So Mary Ellen, I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna turn it over to you to blow our minds with who's new at the zoo today. And we're gonna go on a little journey with her to explore some of the coolest animals there. So welcome back, nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. I absolutely love Jesse's introductions of the zoo. You are right. It is a fantastic place to be. And what a beautiful day we're having right now. It's a gorgeous kind of spring day for us to find out who is new at the zoo, learn all about them. Why did they come here? What are they doing? What are our plans? And hopefully get up close and answer some of your amazing questions about these incredible species that we have here around us and get to enjoy. Before we get started, though, I'm going to have Jesse bring up our land acknowledgement here for us. Um, and so we would just like to acknowledge that the land that we are on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississauga of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also like to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississauga of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. Thank you so much, Jesse. So we are going to get started today. I am actually standing in our Eurasia section of the Toronto Zoo. Um, and if you don't know, the Toronto Zoo is laid out uh, geographically. So we have all these different kind of habitat landmarks or areas around the world that we replicate here with our habitats and the animals who live there. Now, when we say who's new at the zoo, that can be in any area that we have here at the zoo. And there's actually quite a few brand new residents here at the Toronto Zoo. And we're gonna try and meet as many as we can today. So what we're gonna do is we're at our snow leopard exhibit right now to hopefully get an up close look as one of our uh, newer cat residents. And then we're gonna take a little walk and learn about um, some more of our uh, maybe larger but smaller, maybe more newer residences. That'll hint will come into handy in a little bit there for us. Um, and then get up close and personal with some of our smallest new residents here at the zoo as well. So I'm waiting here right now because I can see our lovely snow leopard and she has decided to go for a little lay down in quite possibly the hardest place, unfortunately, for us to see her in. But we're going to try and get a better angle while I tell you a little bit about snow leopards. So let me turn our camera around here for us and see if we can spot Jita and Pemba. So Pemba is our snow leopard who was existing here at the zoo. And Jita is our newest resident here at the zoo. So we're actually in our underwater kind of uh, or under a cave area. And we're going to take a look through the window now. One of them is sitting up the rocks might be blocking our view here for us that might be a little bit harder let's come out this way and see if we can find a different viewpoint uh pemba has been at the zoo for a little bit now he is still relatively new but he has been here for uh, at least the last year or so and he's actually originally from calgary zoo so he's from within canada uh, but he came a little short hop skip a province or two away uh, to come and be with us here at the toronto zoo and he was born in 2014. And in case you don't know what a snow leopard looks like, we'll take this advantage here to take a nice little peek up close at their very, very fluffy face and their very fluffy tail, which will come in handy when we talk about where they like to live as well. Now, Jita was born in the Granby Zoo. Okay, we're gonna hang out here for just one second. It's very, very hard to tell but she's actually sitting right up over there. One of them is up over there right now. I'm not exactly sure which one specifically, um, but we'll talk a little bit about how to tell them apart in just a second. So she was born at the Granby Zoo and she came to us as part of what's called an SSP match. 
So if you followed any of the videos that Jesse and I have done together, uh, you might already know what that acronym, acronym stands for. So that is a species survival plan. And I actually have a little photo for us here. This is what their logo looks like, two little rhinos. So a species survival plan is something that gets put together to uh, help match animals. I like to call it like a dating service for animals in captivity. And we're able to match them up on things like their good genetics and where they are located in the world to see if we can help populate the next generation of that species. All right, and it seems for us here that Jita and Pemba don't want to come out and be live friends with us. So what we're going to do is I'm going to turn the camera back on myself. As we keep talking about them, luckily we come prepared here. Jesse and I never want you to walk away without having an amazing up close view of our animals. So what we're going to do is Jesse's got a video for me ready to play. And we are going to see a couple photos uh, very up close and take a look at them. So this one here, when we're looking at our uh, snow leopards, they do look very, very, very similar. But this is Jita in front of us. Now, she's only two years old. She's going to be three this May. And I know that's her because, and Jesse, do you want to stop the video for me right there just so we can have a little bit more time with the snow leopard? Um, we know it's Jita because she has a darker pink nose and she also has um, kind of a full eyebrow kind of interesting but they have all these little spots all over their body and she has over her left eye uh her dots connect and it gives her almost like a Cruella de Vil eyebrow uh over her left eye it makes her look a little bit more sinister or a little bit more up to something and so that's a good way to tell them apart if you ever get to see them here in person so she's got that eyebrow over her eye and a darker nose and then Pemba our male who's a little bit older uh, he has a very pink nose and we say Pemba with a P for pink. So that's how we can remember his nose is much pinker than hers is and they're able to uh, be, we can tell them apart easily in their exhibit. Now really important, these animals are listed as vulnerable, which means they're not doing so well in the wild and their, their numbers are starting to decline. And this is because of some human interaction that we see. So humans are getting too close to them, they're getting too close to us, and that can cause things like habitat loss or loss of their food source. So their, uh, their food that they're hunting and eating, uh, they, are, uh, they are losing that opportunity to have those hunting experiences, which can make it a little bit harder for them. Now, Jesse, I'll have you, if you're able to, bring the uh, camera back onto me here for a quick second. I actually have something with me in my bag here. Um, I don't know if anyone in our YouTube chats wants to guess what this device is. Anyone know what this is? I actually did a video all about these before with you, Jesse. You did. So we've got a, we've got a ton of people on YouTube and especially the Facebook channel for the Toronto Zoo. So welcome <laughs> from all over everybody. You guys are a great audience. Who knows what this is? And our King's Road School with us live. If you guys want to chime in on StreamYard, you're welcome to. Uh, trail cam. Trail cam. Oh, good. good. That's good. awesome. You are correct. This is a trail cam. So this is a fantastic way for scientists like us and organizations to be able to track animals who are more elusive and harder to find. Snow leopards are known as a ghost cat or the ghost of the mountain. So they like to live up high in cold mountain areas where they blend in really well. I don't know if you could tell by us not being able to find them in their exhibit. They camouflage spectacularly. Uh, but trail cams are a way for us to monitor them and make sure we can tell um, how they're doing, how their numbers are doing, how they look, are they healthy, are they getting enough food, everything like that, to make sure that their population is being monitored and we're trying to do everything we can to help support them. All right, we're gonna switch it back to the slideshow and continue on for our small yet big um, newest member here at the Toronto Zoo. And that'll make more sense once his photo first comes up. It was a pretty uh, big announcement when he arrived. And that's because we waited a very, 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 very long time for him. So this is little baby Faru, um, which means tank or uh, rhino in Swahili. So his name is literally rhino and he is a baby white rhino. And he was born on December 28th, 
2023. So just last year, it's only a couple months old and he is already massive. He is over 600 pounds. So he's gaining, um, I believe, somewhere around 40 pounds a day or something. He is putting on the weight or maybe a little bit less than that, but he's putting on the weight quick and getting nice and big and strong to be as big as his dad, Tom, who is our largest, uh, heaviest animal at the zoo, coming in at just under 5,000 pounds. So he's a pretty big tank, that one. Um, and his son is quickly, quickly taking after his abilities. So Kafaru is a great ambassador for his species as well. Unfortunately, he lives way back in the savannah here at the Toronto Zoo, which is quite possibly the furthest away from where I am right now with our snow leopards. So we can't get up to him right now to see him in person. But if you follow us on social media at all, if you're on our Facebook page, we post lots of updates and videos of him. He's super playful. That's him with his mom, Sabby, and they are learning how to get along. Uh, he's learning how to be a little tough baby rhino. So it takes a lot out of him, spends a good amount of his day napping and uh, just kind of having fun. But he is able to um, have such a great experience up there. And he's another great example as well of an SSP pairing. So again, we match up our animals genetically to make sure that they're able to be healthy and have uh, this sort of uh, good interaction with all the other animals around them. But then also they can be an ambassador and they are used for education like this and programs like ours where they can help share uh, the message of conservation for their animals. Now, one of our main questions that we get a lot when we do videos together, Jesse, is where do the animals come from? And so Kufaro is a great example of they were born here at the zoo. And then Jita and Pemba are great examples of animals who were born in other facilities, other accredited facilities that come to us here at the Toronto Zoo and are able to have their home here with us. And hopefully in the future, we will have maybe a a cub from our snow leopard pair as well. They've been introduced a few times and we're hoping for them to have a good SSP match. Now it's important to know that animals like our rhinos and our snow leopards are more of a solitary species. So we do have to be careful when introducing them. Oh, Jesse, that's the cue. We can pause that video there. Um, there we go. Uh, we have to be careful when we're introducing them. So there's a lot of work and finesse that goes into it. We can't just throw two animals together and say, here you go. You may not like you. They may not like each other. We don't always like everyone we meet in our lives. And so we have to take that into consideration as well when matching up our animals. And this is done by the keepers and the vet team and the SSP match as well. And we do something called a howdy with the animals at first, which is basically they're able to see each other. They can smell each other but there's always some sort of barrier or some sort of protectant between them and each other so that they're both safe. And if either of them are showing any signs of, hey, I don't like this very much, or maybe we're not too big of a fan of what's happening, then we're able to back off, maybe give them some space from each other and try again on another day. So it's really cool to see the dynamic between the animals, their keepers looking after them, and all the other staff here at the zoo who make those matchups and those new residents possible here at the zoo. All right, we've got a few moments here before we go in and see our next smallest animal. So Jesse, why don't we see if there's any questions about our rhinos and our snow leopards before we go in and see our next friends? You hit the nail on the head. We've already got some questions coming in. <laughs> I'm in Ramaj's class, joining us all the way in Alaska. So welcome in again, you guys. Uh, they wanted to know what the rhinos eat. What are we feeding them? Ooh, that's a great question. Yeah, they get pretty big. So you'd assume that they need to eat a lot. Uh, they are actually a herbivore species. So if you don't know what that means, they're an animal that's just eating plant material, vegetation, and they eat a ton of it, like literally a ton of it. They love hay. Uh, they get lots and lots of hay as much as they want all day, every day. They can just chew and munch on it their, to their little heart's content. And they're also getting some other snacks as well. So they'll be getting uh, lettuce and different vegetation. So like carrots, um, different veggies that they could have. Sometimes we get donated mass amounts of large uh, produce from nearby stores here at the zoo. And as long as it's safe and we've done our research, we can offer animals like that. Maybe a new food that they would have never tried in the wild. 
Some of them like it, some of them don't. Kind of depends on the animal. Um, you know, near Halloween, you might see some more pumpkins and things like that out in our exhibits. Uh, and they also really like, we tend to get an increase of pine trees. Um, they don't always eat them per se, but they will kind of chew on them or rub up against them as a, a really interesting scent for them as well. So right after the holiday season, we tend to get a lot of uh, pine trees donated to the zoo as well, which is a really cool enrichment item that we can give them. So yeah, they are eating pretty much all vegetation all the time. And then our little baby tank puppy is what his nickname was. He's drinking a lot of milk from his mom as well. Nice. Very all. That's fantastic. We've got a few more questions. If you've got a few, like five minutes or so before we dive in. So let's definitely come in. Uh, Miss Keenan's class, welcome in our Ottawa Carleton Virtual Secondary School. They want to know when do rhinos get their horn? So is it from birth? Is it not long after? We've never actually had this question before. I like this. That's a great question. Yeah. So you probably noticed in my little slideshow of uh, Kufaru's uh, photos, he's kind of got, I call it a bunny face almost. He's got like these really matte, very in tune with Easter. Um, he's got these massive ears and kind of a long, flat looking face. And he kind of looks like a little bunny rabbit in that case. Um, so luckily for mama rhinos, their babies are not born with horns. That would be quite difficult. The babies are already born about 100 to 150 pounds, um, which is sometimes the size of a full grown or the weight of a full grown human. So that's that's a good enough weight for a mama to, to be pushing out. Um, at about a year, they start to get it. So we'll see over the next couple of months, his horn will start to break through on his nose and it'll start to grow. And I know this wasn't part of the question, but I'm going to throw one back. Anyone in the audience? We've talked about it a lot here. What is a rhino horn made out of? What is it? Is it bone? We've said this a few times for our long-term yeah. listeners. This was, this was one of our, like, I think, clues at one point in one of our broadcasts. Um, I think it was. Let's see. Okay, so you guys are a bit of a fantastic audience, by the way. You're, like, super on the ball. So I'm going to give you a few seconds. We've got bone as our first guess. That is incorrect. Bone, mm -hmm. it's, very, it's, it's the most obvious answer, but it's not mm -hmm. bone. It's not skin. That's our other answer. Great guesses, yeah. guys. Keep them coming. I'm going to give you a few more. Oh, hair. What on earth? Keratin. Janet. Janet. I've seen Janet before. Hello, Janet. Um, so Keratin. Yes, hair. Fingernail. The same thing that makes up those materials. That's what makes up rhino horn. There we go. Exactly. It is a uh, protein called keratin, and it's the same as what's in your hair or what's in your fingernails as well, which is really cool. So theirs is just super compact on their nose. And actually, you'll frequently see them kind of rubbing their face on different items, um, and they sharpen it into that big point that they have. And the white rhino, I'll say, they have two massive horns. That's kind of when I think of a rhino in my head, that's the rhino I picture. There's also one called the Greater One Horn Rhino who we featured before in videos with Jesse. They've got kind of like a tinier little nub on their face. That's not really their, their shtick is the horn as much. We still love them though. That's not their shtick, the horn. Thank you for <laughs> yeah. that part of my day. Um, we're going to take two more quick ones and then we're going to go meet our third animal. We got a quick Perfect. one about, do snow leopards need a cold climate to survive? That's a fantastic question. So do they need a cold climate to survive? They are definitely equipped to survive in a cold climate for sure. That is a hundred percent. They are meant to be in the cold. That big fluffy tail of theirs acts like a scarf and an insulator for them. Um, but they are able to come down the mountain and, you know, where they live in, uh, in parts of Asia still goes through different seasonal changes themselves. So they're able to adapt to a slightly warmer climate. Because our snow leopards as well have lived in this climate for their entire life, they're better at adapting to our slightly warmer summers that we have here. And we have lots of uh, ways that we help cool them off. So they get sprinklers in the summertime, like a mister that drips cool air on them that they can lay under. Lots of cool, rocky areas that can, they can help dissipate their heat. Um, they get uh, meatsicles in the nicest way possible. They get ice cubes frozen with snacks inside or just ice frozen on its own. And they love to rub up all on it and kind of lay on top of it as it melts. And their house is also air conditioned. So they do have access to cooler weather when it's very, very, very hot. I have never had a meatsicle in my entire <laughs> life. That sounds delicious. Yeah. Um, we're going to take one more and then we're going to go explore our third animal. I'm so excited for you to meet them in a second. Uh, but our King's Road crew, I'm sorry you guys are having a little bit of tech trouble with us here on StreamYard. Uh, but Miss K's class wants to know if rhinos ever lose their horns like moose or deer lose their antlers, which is a great question. Definitely. Yeah. So that can happen. Um, I hope this doesn't happen to anyone on the call. So moose 
and deer, they are losing their antlers um, on purpose. It's like an annual shed that they do. Like a caribou sheds their antlers yearly and then they grow back bigger every year after that as they get stronger and get older. Horns are meant to stay on an animal for their whole life. It's meant to be there. But occasionally they can rip them off by mistake. It's not fun. It's not pretty. And it does hurt a little bit. Um, it's usually they'll be rubbing it on something and they get caught. And it's if you've ever uh, had a fingernail snag on a piece of clothing before or somebody might have lost a full fingernail or a toenail, that can happen in humans as well. They do grow back, but it takes a little bit of time. And that area is just a little bit tender. So one of our previous uh, greater one horn rhinos named Ashakiran, she actually did that once. She itched it and she lost her whole horn, but she was able to grow it back in full. It was all good after the fact. Um, she was just a little tender on her nose for a little bit as it grew back. Good question, though. What a great question. And with that, I just keep those questions coming, folks, on YouTube and Facebook. But we're going to go explore with another animal friend and uh, blow your minds a little. We are indeed. So I'm going to turn our camera back around here. I have made it over to another area in our zoo. We are actually in our kids zoo uh, section of the zoo and we have two of our smallest new additions uh, to the team here and we are going to turn the camera around so you can get the full view of them first um, and get a chance to meet our little armadillo. There he is. Where'd he go? Oh, he's hiding on us. Honestly, the snow leopard hit on us too today. So that's okay if he wants to play a little hide and seek. We'll give him a second to come out. He, I just came in the room with him. So I might have spooked him just briefly. But we'll see if he wants to come out. And you can see there's lots of fun enrichment for him in here. And we'll get to learn a little bit about it. Now we have two of my friends in here with us, two of my keeper friends. And I'm actually going to pull my headphones out here. So Jesse, let me know if our audio is still good. You, you are still hear perfectly, perfectly audible. You're great. Fantastic. All right. And we're going to learn about our keepers or about our armadillo <laughs> from their keepers and uh, learn a little bit more about them. All right. Hi, I'm Shannon. I'm one of the keepers here in our outreach department. And right now we have Cusco hanging out with us. So Cusco is our brand new three banded armadillo. And he's having a lot of fun inside this log today. It's one of his favorite places to try to dig. Um, but I have put some delicious mealworms as a little treat in another piece of enrichment, which is sort of like a bug feeder or a slow feeder. So uh, he is using his very strong sense of smell to sniff out where those bugs are. And then you can see that he's using his long pointy nose to go in and around and underneath all of those flexible flowers and leaves and this is imitating how he would find food in the wild so takes an extra little bit of effort for him to actually get those bugs which is great because out in the wild the bugs aren't just going to be scattered right in front of him handed to him on a silver platter he is going to have to do a little bit of extra work and you can see that he is loving it which is perfect um, but three banded armadillos are a pretty small species of armadillo. There are about 20 different species of armadillos out there. Um, and they can range from really small, can fit in one hand, to almost the size of a raccoon. But three bandits are quite small, like I said. And even though Cusco is young, he's only nine months old. Uh, he is almost fully grown. So um, he's not going to get very much bigger than he is right now. And the reason that he's called a three-banded armadillo is because if you saw when he came out a little bit more, um, he has three bands of the protective, uh, sort of like a shell on his back, on his body. And that's how you can tell this type of armadillo from other ones because they have more bands than just the three. There you go, you're getting a better view there. <laughs> he's coming um, to see us now. He, okay, yeah, a little bit more, he's getting more breathe. Um, but uh, I was talking about how he sort of has a shell and I don't like calling it a shell because it's not exactly the same, but it's the best way to describe what he's covered in. Um, so he is a mammal. If we were to look at sort of where his neck is or if he was flipped upside down, you would see lots of really hairy skin. Um, it's almost like pig skin or like warthog skin. It's really tough. Um, it almost looks like dry and scaly. And then he also has lots of hair under there too. It's really wiry, thick hair, almost like extra whiskers all over his body. 
Um, but then from the top, he kind of looks like a turtle. And that's because he's covered in keratin, which is the same thing that a turtle shell is made of. It's also the same thing that our fingernails are made of. So it's just a really hard protective outer coating of his body. And um, he uses that to stay safe. And uh, three-banded armadillos are also one of the only species that can completely roll up into a ball. Now, unfortunately, I can't show you that with Cusco uh, because they only do that when they're scared. So it's actually really good that he's not doing it for us because it means he's really comfortable. But armadillos in the wild, if they're feeling scared or threatened or if they just kind of want to hide, they can curl completely up and their head and their tail fit together like a perfect puzzle. And then they're so round that he could, they could even roll down a hill. Um, and that works really well for protection. It confuses predators. They don't want to eat something that's hard and round. And he can also snap shut. He's very, very strong. He's stronger than he looks. And so if you're a predator trying to dig inside or stick your fingers in and he snaps on you, it's as strong as getting our fingers caught in a car door. So it would hurt a lot. And even for a little animal, that gives animals a warning to leave him alone. So um, yeah, hopefully you can see now too on his cute little face. Um, it sort of looks like he's wearing a helmet and that's called a head plate. And uh, that's on his head all of the time. It's a part of his body. It's completely connected onto him. But again, that's for protection. And when he closes up, his little ears fold in and he fits perfectly all together. Well, that was spectacular. And nice to see you again, Shannon. Uh, hey, Jesse. <laughs> all right. Uh, we in the small world. We used to work at Ripley's together. Uh, sure did. Got, uh, by the way, everyone is obsessed with our armadillo friend. You've never had more cute comments on YouTube and Facebook in history. Uh, our description of the eating mechanism is snorfling, which I like to think is particularly delightful. And I do have a quick armadillo question if we can sneak it in before we continue going on. Of uh, course. So the question was, are armadillos particularly related to pangolins, which I'm so glad people know pangolins because they rock too. Anything you can share on that would be great. That mm. is a fantastic question. Um, and I think you've actually got our, our experts here potentially stumped, which Jesse, as you know, whoever asked that question, that rarely happens to us it's here. Nice. Um, we will find out though, and we will bring it up again, or Jesse and I have a really good tactic of uh, being able to research on the fly here as well. I actually just did a quick Google search as we were getting that question. So they're, they're not particularly, we used to think that they were some of the closest relatives and actually pangolins now we sort of link closer to the carnivores. Armadillos are in a really weird group that a lot of the South American animals are in. So anteaters, armadillos, sloths, there's a bunch of creatures that have really weird joints. And so they're oh. called, their, their, group, their group is literally called like alien joint or weird joint, if you translate it. Uh, and that's armadillo's closest relatives in the animal kingdom. But that's a really neat question, guys. Thank you so much. That was for that. a fantastic question. And Jesse, your answer was a fantastic segue for us into Ooh. our next animal, um, of what we would call the arboreal anteater. Yeah. Although I want to give a close up of his food. Oh, this is so we, yummy. The group is expected to this. We talked about meat sickles a few moments oh, ago. So this okay. is a fantastic uh, second portion here for us. So who do we have here with us? All right. So this is Pacha. And Pacha is a southern tamandua, tamandua, or also known as a lesser anteater because they are the smaller arboreal cousins of the greater anteater, uh, the giant anteater. Do you want to come on down for your snacks, buddy? You <laughs> He's going to show off how strong he is. And in the back, you can see that awesome tail he has. So arboreal is just a really fancy word for saying these guys love to live up in trees. They are incredible climbers. You can see on his front, even his back feet. Take a look at these nails. They are massive. They use for climbing high into the treetops. But they are ant eaters, so they also use them for ripping apart termite mounds and going after ant hills and all that fun stuff. And you can see he absolutely absolutely loves his snacks. I told uh, Mary Ellen that he is such a messy eater. Like he loves it. So Pacha here, he's just over a year old. So he's still very young. He'll get a little bit bigger, but not too much. And about a year and a half old, that's when they're done growing. He was born last December. So he's still just young. Um, 
And these guys, they have one of the longest tongues ever at 40 centimeters. It's insane. It's kind of hard to see when he's like putting it right in the slot like that. <laughs> and it's so funny. He's blowing bubbles because the food all goes up his nose. So the food is an insectivore kibble, but he likes it as a slurry. So I'm a big fan of booster juice. I love their smoothies. He loves his insect booster juice smoothie. He gets every single day. Don't worry, though. We use a different blender for them. <laughs> yeah. Than we do for the people. <laughs> You can see right there. He's like, oh, hi, buddy. Nice close-up of all that snotty goodness. They don't have the best eyesight. Their eyes are very small and beady, uh, but it's all about the sense of smell for them when it comes to finding insects underground. They will eat small. They will eat soft fruits and vegetables as well, but everything needs to be soft because they actually don't have any teeth whatsoever. Um, so how they catch their food is that very long sticky tongue comes out. They shoot it into a termite mound or an anthill, slurp it back in, and then their stomach acids are what helps to break down their food. They can eat up to 9,000 ants or termites a day. And what's really cool about these animals is they'll smell out the queens of the colonies and they actually leave them alone they're sustainable eaters they don't want to ruin a colony because that means they're going to have to travel further or further away from home so they'll try to eat only workers they can smell the difference and then that way they'll know how much they're eating so they'll leave a colony behind as well so they totally don't decimate it that so that way they're they're good little guardians of the rainforest <laughs> They also have the nickname Stinkers of the Forest. Um, we're pretty much immune to it now, the smell, but it is quite pungent. Um, and they, it's so if they're ever threatened, they do release a musk just like a skunk does, but it's actually four times more powerful than that of a skunk's. So they can smell pretty bad when they want to. But luckily, we hasn't felt threatened, so we've never smelled it. <laughs> Hopefully it stays that way for us today. Yeah. This so is his amazing, tail by the way. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. What? I just want to say it's amazing. The feedback has been incredible. And as always, even though we had a few of our first animals hiding out, we always get the best luck in Toronto Zoo programs. Like, I can't believe we're this close to a damn and do a I'm over the moon. <laughs> oh. Yeah, this is really good for him, too, because he is still learning to be our ambassadors, just like the armadillos. Um, so he is in training right now to come down, and he actually puts a harness on and a leash on to go for walks, hopefully around the site, because they are such great climbers. We need to make sure we have a way of getting him down from places safely. So this is good for him because besides myself, uh, we have Mary Ellen and his pen with him too, which can be scary Two people versus one, especially for newer animals at the zoo. So this is also just great for him hanging out, getting food with his camera in his face. Learning, there's not too much to be afraid here. So he's still figuring it all out. And he's take, he, I think he has to take breaths because he gets so much food in his nose. And you can see like he loves it so much. And he's got that beautiful glossy coat. So he's a southern tamandua, and these guys can range quite a bit in coloration. They can be almost completely black, they can be gray, they can be completely white. He's almost like a platinum blonde coloration. Um, we do have a female named Yzma, so I don't know if you guys said it earlier, we're really big fans of Emperor's New Groove. Mm -hmm. So Pacha and Yzma. Yzma, our female, she's a little bit more shy, so we're just respecting her space, so we're not going to go into it, but she has that really dark coloration, it's called a vest. If you guys are able to Google it at home, they have that best coloration oh he might be all done no okay never mind we're not done <laughs> just changing locations where he's got the really blonde coloration um northern tamanduas they are definitely smaller in size and they just kind of stick to that one coloration the really big and um contrast vest that they have on their bodies i just love that he's showing off his tail and his claws right now that was the biggest thing for me and like we said they are new to the zoo and so it's a really cool thing i always like to tell people because in these videos i know i sometimes sound smart when i'm talking about our animals but it's because i know the animals that we have here at the toronto zoo and they're the ones who we take care of and we do a lot of programming with so when we get a new animal it's a amazing time for all of us because we're able to do lots of research and figure things out about them and for me seeing their tail was one of the most interesting parts i did not realize that their tail uh looked like that i knew it was prehensile so you can see he's actually wrapping it up around now the branch for a better kind of angle on his food um but it looks very similar to a rat's tail to me and i wasn't uh i wasn't positive about that when i saw it i, I was very confused by it so it was a really cool thing to be able to see such a new incredible species now, I think we'll move back to our other room really quickly. Um, and we'll say goodbye to Pacha here. But as we're going, you might have noticed, uh, we already did mention that we have a theme with their names. 
and we've met Kronk, but now we're going to meet another friend in here. Where is he at over here? Oh, same place. We really same like place. that. Uh, we really like our, our little home over there. Sorry, we met Cusco before, but now we're going to meet Kronk. And if you've ever wondered how the Toronto animals get their names, which is really exciting, some of them do come with their names for us, uh, or they already have their name but some of them as well get named here. So we like to suggest different names, but if you follow us on social media, you might get the opportunity one day to vote on their name. So Pacha and Isma were actually just a part of a vote a little while ago, and that was the successful match that won. Um, there were some other honorable mentions for sure out there. Jesse seems very happy, so I'm assuming he voted for their name. I, I mean, I'm very happy. I'm sure you're going to say it in a minute, but these all these names have a linkage to them, which is that they're all part of the greatest, one of the best Disney movies ever made, <laughs> ever. It's really underrated. Never should go see it when they're done this broadcast. <laughs> we agree. We absolutely love it. And I think the thematic names make everything just more interesting uh, here for them. So while we are here with Kronk, um, we met our three-banded armadillo. He is a Screaming Harry armadillo, which quite possibly is the best name for an animal. Um, it's right up there for me with the uh, red-tailed green rat snake. <laughs> I find it just to be a very descriptive name and I think all animals should be named uh, just after qualities about them. Uh, so he is hairy indeed. Um, as we were learning before, they do have little hairs all over them because they are a mammal um, and they can scream as well as a, as a form of defense or um, if they're feeling threatened or anything like that. So very descriptive names we have. But while we have Kronk here, I think it's time, uh, Jesse, to open up the floor for some more questions for us. Oh, well, uh, again, thank you so, so much for such an incredible journey uh, around the zoo. We got the chance to hang out with some amazing animals. We got a chance to see some awesome video. Again, I want to stress everyone can go to torontozoo.com if you want to find out more about their education and conservation work. Uh, but as Mary Ellen said, we are going to take some questions together. So start chiming in. Miss Kay's class on StreamYard, uh, please do share in the chat everyone on YouTube and beyond. Let me scroll back up to see some of our, our rhino and snow leopard questions. And if you want to get some of both Tamandua and our armadillo friends, please, please do. Uh, one of our questions earlier was, how are we going to know when our uh, pregnancy takes place? Basically, when we're doing these species survival plans, uh, is there a sort of, do we see it? Are we going to know from any samples we're taking from them? How do we know when things have gone well? That's a great question. And we can link it back. We've actually done a video with you, Jesse, before um, at our Greater One Horn Rhinos uh, with one of my colleagues, Morgan. And she was part of our uh, science and reproductive teams. And we talked all about how we noticed that. So um, our keepers work very closely here with our vet staff and other reproductive science team members. Um, and they're able to collect samples. So this is you know, a little exhibit here for our armadillos, but of course they're gonna to go to the bathroom in, in different places, um, or sometimes we can get blood samples as well from animals. And particularly for pregnancies, it's really important to get those samples as the way that we tell is there's a, usually a hormone spike in their uh, fecal or blood samples that we can track. But for a lot of animals, they are actually able to have what's called pseudo pregnancies or a kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, false pregnancies and their, their hormones can spike and they aren't actually pregnant or, uh, you know, maybe they're doing a delayed implantation. There's all sorts of ways. So the keeping staff here work very, very closely with the other teams at the zoo and they're able to get those results and we can track their hormones to see. And, and the keeping staff, they're the ones who know our animals the best. That's why whenever I'm behind the scenes with an animal, I always have at least one keeper with me to kind of give me the signal or not if we're scaring an animal or getting too close because they know their personalities the best and they know how much they want to be on camera or be around a stranger like myself. Fantastic. Thanks, Mary Ellen. That was marvelous. Um, all right. We've got one about animals experiencing growing pains. We talked about rhinos growing up very fast. Do we know if animals experience growing pains? Are there examples of this? Do they have awkward teenage phases like any pimples or anything else that goes on in the teen? So they definitely go through the awkward, I would say even toddler phase. Uh, I can definitely say that our animals go through the terrible twos, the uh, terrible threes, and there's that kind of gawky stage. I don't know if it's evident that they're in pain from growing pains. I know that humans can definitely feel sore, um, but baby animals just in general will sleep a lot. 
They're very, very sleepy animals and that's because they're growing. So it takes a lot of energy to get big fast and they need to, to be able to protect themselves in the wild. Being tiny and vulnerable is not a super great trait. So they've got to learn to put on, um, you know, grow anything they need and their horns or their size just so they can defend themselves. So they spend a lot of time sleeping and I would say that kind of relates to a growing pain in a yeah. sense. That's, that's a good answer. We've never had that question before. That's a really tricky one. It's hard to get inside an animal's head to see if it's like having a little bit of an achy time with getting a little bigger. So great question, guys. Let's head on uh, for a few others. Time flies and you're having fun. We are in our final few minutes of the broadcast. So I'll take as many as I can with Ariel until then. Uh, but one of our questions from our Harry Potter fan on YouTube is, how are giant anteaters and tree anteaters related? Or are they? Great question. So animals can kind of have uh, relations in different ways. You can have them be like genetically related for sure. Um, and so then if you trace back, that means they come from a common ancestor. But then you can also just have relations of animals. Um, you know, they're, they're both mammals and they do a lot of things similarly. So if they live in a similar habitat or occupy a similar, similar niche in their habitat, which means a job or a role, then you'll see that they have a lot of very similar traits and that can kind of indicate that they are related. So between anteaters and tamaduas, we can see, you know, they both have that quality of that long tongue, the long nose, uh, they stick it into ant hills. They're eating the same foods. Um, they're just kind of occupying them on different levels or of the habitat. So an ant eater is more ground level. They're quite large. If you have not Googled a photo of them, they're they're much bigger than touches. And uh, the tamaduas are more on a barboreal species. So um, like you're saying, they're up in the trees. So they're doing the same job in the habitat, just at different levels in the habitat. There's also a pygmy anteater too, which is really tiny, but do check out a giant anteater. They are huge. They can be over six feet long. Their claws are so long, they can fight off a jaguar. So they're a very, they're an awesome, awesome animal. Everyone should see a giant anteater when they're done this broadcast after you've seen the emperor's new groove, of course. All right. Tammy wants to know, uh, as a sort of second last question, we'll wrap up not long after this. Is there a favorite treat of theirs? Our screaming hairy armadillo, for instance. Uh, does he have a favorite treat? What's the deal? Snickers? I think his favorite treats are definitely the bugs. So he gets a lot of mealworms and crickets and we've tried other bugs like superworms too. And he eats all of them. Um, I do have some crickets here for him. Uh, the fun thing about feeding cronk crickets is that he uh, can't really catch them. His eyesight is not very strong. And so he goes chasing them. Um, he was sleepy just before this, so that's why he's like being a little bit more slow and he's hanging around the log. But I'm going to throw a few in there and we'll see if he wants to catch them. He does love them when he gets them, but it's a lot of work. So we'll see if he can get them. Oh, we've got stirring. A creature was stirring. Wrong even way. a screaming hairy armadillo. By the way, Shannon, you threw in the word superworm there very casually, but that sounds really cool. <laughs> What's they a do worm? sound really cool. It's basically just a giant mealworm, but they are super in the in the sense of the size. <laughs> <laughs> we have very much piqued our, our friend's curiosity with the crickets here. This is a what it's like a wild goose chase, but a wild cricket chase live in the broadcast. Uh, Guys, this has been so, so much fun. Uh, Mary Ellen, Shannon, the whole team at Toronto Zoo, you guys uh, did an amazing job as always showcasing some really, really cool wildlife. Uh, YouTube and Facebook audience, you guys are like the most positive ever. I think we're going to need to come back to our uh, South American creatures here and the Emperor's New Groove team because it's like the all the hearts ever we've ever gotten in our history. So thank you guys for being a great audience. And I, all I want to do is wrap up with one final note. Mary Ellen, is there any last message about who's new at the zoo that you want to share with our audience today? Anything we can send them home with before Easter? 100%. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us again. These are such a great way for us to spread con conservation information about our animals and learning to love the animals that we have in the world around us and love their habitats is the best way for us to save them and protect them for the future. So if an animal that you met today or learned about today sparks your interest, please do some more research on them, check them out. There's lots of ways to get involved, but one of the best is just by supporting our videos here with us uh, on Jesse's channel and at the Toronto Zoo. There's lots of ways uh, for you to spread the conservation message for us and help us introduce everyone to who is new at the zoo so they get you know their little moment in the spotlight as well.
Outstanding. We certainly had a lot of people asking about other creatures. And again, we've done over 30 broadcasts of the zoo. We do one every month. So if you want to learn about some really incredible animals around the planet, come join us. Uh, check out our newsletter. Check out the Toronto Zoo's website, YouTube, Facebook page. Lots of great ways to keep the learning going. Uh, Mary Ellen and Shannon, everyone, our armadillo friend, I'm just going to say a big thank you and farewell on behalf of our audience. Uh, have a wonderful, wonderful day, everyone. And we'll see you.